Welcome to our Database Society panel tonight. We're so excited to have you all here. We're super grateful for McKinsey for hosting us. Let's give a round of applause for Kent McKinsey. And a big thanks to Jason and Yaakov who helped coordinate and set this up and bring us together. So, without further ado, let's dive in. I think many of you know a lot of the panelists already, but we're going to let them introduce themselves. I'll start by introducing who I am. I'm going to be moderating tonight, and I am a database designer at Pentagram on Georgia Luffy's team. And I'm super excited to be moderating. We've got a lot of good questions tonight, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Jill, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jill Hewley. I'm a data visualization engineer at WeWork. <coughs> WeWork. Um, <laughs> I've been doing databases for about six years. In addition to um, visual pieces, I also do a lot of data related. Hey, my name is Nadine Bremer. I'm from a little town near Amsterdam, and I happen to be in New York this week, so I'm really happy to join sort of this meetup. This database in the Netherlands is kind of small. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I used to, used to be in Toronto, and then we became data scientists to figure out that database was very cooler. So for the past like four or five years, I've been doing database. Hi, hey, everyone. My name is Press. 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 Oh, okay. I was like, the light is on, so it must be on. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Shirley. I'm from San Francisco, but I'm actually here for three months uh, doing a fellowship at NYU ITP. The echo on this is like really unnerving. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I am a freelance data visualization person. Um, and just really excited to be here. Great. So the first question I want to start off with is, what was your guys' path into database? Um, we were talking on Slack earlier, and I'm sure many of you have similar experiences, but it's rare for us, thank you, to, it's rare for people in database to have all the same path. I feel like we all come from very different backgrounds, different experiences, um, maybe study something different in school. So how did each of you find Databiz, and um, what, like, was there a moment when you were like, oh, this is what I want to do? Let's start with Shirley, we'll go backwards. Cool. Okay, yeah. Um, so I studied uh, business. My major was business in undergrad, and I minored in computer science. Um, and my first job out of college was at a big data company called Splunk. Um, and this was when D3 was just like one year old, it was like 2012, um, and they were trying to like look at if D3 was a good thing to switch to from high charts, and because I was like the new kid without any projects, my manager was like, hey, do you want to look into this new D3 thing? And I was like, sure, why not? Um, and so that's how I got into it. Um, I didn't know that data visualization was a thing. Um, I just thought it was really fun. Um, and then it wasn't until I joined the Bay Area D3 user group about a year later that I realized it was actually a thing that I could do. Um, and it wasn't until maybe like a few years after that um, that I realized it was a thing that I really wanted to do as kind of like my focus. There was like a period of a few months before that where I was like, I am a software engineer, not a friend an engineer. I am not going to like get pigeonholed into JavaScript or something. Um, it was like a weird, um, and I, I tried to like re use like reteach myself Python and Java and Ruby and be like, I'm gonna do this back end thing. Um, and then like a, three months later, I realized I like really hated it. And I realized that, um, <laughs> that data visualization was actually really perfect for me because um, I grew up doing art uh, for like 14 years until university. And then um, one of my favorite subjects in like, school was math. And I realized that data visualization was like this perfect combination of art and code and math. Um, and so I've been here ever since. 
Uh, yeah, for me, the actual moment that I knew that this was my thing was like a, a, like a, a switch that flipped. Um, so, as I said, I, I started out as astronomy, knew I didn't want to continue because I, I love the subject, hate writing papers. <laughs> and so I went to work with uh, Deloitte Consulting as a data scientist, and in that sense had to make charts, uh, to put into the presentation decks. And about four years in, being a data scientist, I, I knew that it wasn't driving me as much as it used to, but I didn't know what I, you know, what I should do about that. And I was at a data science conference in Barcelona at the time, kind of thinking about this. And then um, Mike Freeman, who's also, he, he teaches database, I believe, now in Madrid, um, he was on stage and his first slide said, data visualization specialist. When I read that, my world changed. I'm like, that's a thing? You can do just that? It's not part of data science? And, and at that moment, when I read that, and I saw like that's a thing, it's like, wait a minute. That's where my passion is. That's where, in the evenings after work, I spent extra hours to make that slide, that visualization for that slide perfect, to explain it to my audience. And from that moment on, I, I switched and try to learn as much about database and B3 as possible. Amazing. Um, yeah, my path was similarly um, not direct. Um, so I studied art, and um, <laughs> after college, I, I worked for a bunch of nonprofits doing sort of broader communication stuff. Um, the, the one uh, nonprofit I worked for had this website that was horrible looking. It was like, Table based, and I'm dating myself, but you know, well, or maybe it was just a really, really terrible website. <laughs> um, anyway, I asked to like redesign it basically, and they're like, sure. And then I got really into web development and started doing a lot of um, work with um, Drupal and other open source content management systems. Did that for a while, and became a freelancer, more web stuff, yada yada. Um, and then I guess it was like probably. 2014, um, but basically I just really wanted um, to create this map um, of all of the trees in Prospect Park, because I walked there every day with my dog, and I was just like, it'd be really cool to get to know what these trees are. Um, so I looked for the data, and it wasn't there. There wasn't, um, uh, you know, the trees in that park hadn't been surveyed at that time. They have since been. But, uh, but so I was just looking around for other data, and so I found this data on street trees in New York City. And I was like, oh, I could just map the trees in Brooklyn. And I was like, you know, I sort of know how to like code stuff. I'm sure I can figure out this JavaScript thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Turned out, it, you know, it was like six. It was, so it was Brooklyn that I started with. I ended up doing the whole city, and uh, it's like, I don't know, 650,000 points. And so it was like um, an interesting project to start with because there's a, a Deep learning curve, but <laughs> but because it was information that like I really cared about and like was really super interested in, it just made the process really fun. Um, and so once I did that, um, basically I was like, I'm not going to do CMS work anymore. I'm just going to do this stuff. And so then I started um, working with other nonprofits and uh, like the Nature Conservancy and a bunch of others um, to do data this for them. And, and then I got into you know some other lanes, uh, still doing data this work. So. So interesting to hear just how different our paths are, but they always converge in a great spot. <laughs> and this is this really intense first project. I'm amazed you like completed it. Like I have a graveyard of uncompleted projects, especially when I was first starting out. So that's that took a lot of uh, determination. I have a graveyard too. I'm sure we all do. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about process. Um, I think most people are generally familiar with the database process, so creating, starting with a concept or idea or a question, finding data like you did, um, and creating it after you do that, um, exploring it, looking for insights, finding insights, and then designing or coding the final piece, and then tweaking it for eternity. <laughs> um, that's my experience, at least. Uh, but, so with this general process, have you guys, you've made so many visualizations, it's got to be like just, is it easy, does it remain easy, or are, is it still challenging, is it an emotional roller coaster? I'm still like relatively new, and when I'm like 
a few weeks into a project, I'm just like, it's terrible, I'm dead, this is terrible, I'm the worst, and it's just like, emotion I'm very emotionally like connected to my work, and I'm like, will I always be this emotionally like roller coaster with my with the process, or does it smooth out? Does it get better? <laughs> so, Emotionally, I feel like each project is always difficult because it's you're at the start. You have this data set; it's just numbers, and then you make it. You have to make it visual and explainable, and you're like, oh, I'm gonna do it this time. Maybe, maybe this time it'll. It's just you know, I'm gonna fail and get and just crash and burn. So that's always in my mind. But I have noticed that it took me a year, but I, that I finally, after a year, I could write some parts of P3 just from from my memory instead of having to always look it up. Wow. So, you know, those first few steps, so that's like, you know, you have to celebrate the small victories that's in that sense. Like, that's you know, being able to get to that yeah. point. Um, no, but I guess each each project is like the, the unknown that you get back into. Uh, and the only thing I also feel is that if, as you do more and more, you, I feel like I get more comfortable with the feeling of not knowing where I will end up because I know that I felt it before. Eventually, I seem to manage to get to that end point. So it's like, okay, it's okay. We'll just do step number one, and once we've done step number one, we'll look at number two, and maybe we need to go back to one, and then we'll see that we got to up two again. So it's, for me, it feels kind of like that. Yeah, I think. Um knowing that it's going to be difficult is really like the only way it gets easier. <laughs> but I mean, I think for me, like I think about it in terms of like making art, like when I make a piece, I'll be, I'll be whatever painting or whatever. And then like, you know, a couple weeks and I'll be like, this is total garbage and I just want to throw it away. And I mean, at least with code, like everything is, um, you know, in a repository. <laughs> so if I, you know, you know, just trash it all, like I can at least go back and like start rebuilding again. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just like you have to know there are going to be moments when you hate it and you just like have to find a way to get through those and like get to a place where you're happy with it. Totally. I think uh, for me personally, my strongest is the code part, so just because um, I came from the software engineering background. And for the longest time, I thought of data, or I did personal projects for the sake of a good technical challenge. Um, so this is this is a little bit veering off of your question, but um, yeah. So um, I think then I when I started freelancing three years ago, when Nadia and I started doing the data sketches project, I think that was like a really great um, few month, well, years of learning where just like. Um, seeing how Nadia approaches things because Nadia approaches it from a very like data analysis, data science, and communicating points to an audience. Whereas like I, when we first started doing it in 2016, my whole thing was like, I'm gonna just like do this thing that's really fun in code, and if I can just accomplish that, like that's all I care about. I don't care about readability. Like if people can't understand it, whatever I have fun, <laughs> <laughs> which is like the worst way to approach a data visualization. Um, and so I've since like um, tried to teach myself design, tried to teach myself. Um, the data analysis part of it. And I think for me personally, it's still really that data part that I get really stuck on. Um, just because everything for data analysis for me personally is self-taught. So I'm like always really insecure about like, am I doing this the right way? Is this thing that I did? Like this statistical analysis I did that I don't really understand, but I just found this like no package. Like, is it the right thing to use? Like, if I visualize this, like, would an audience care? So that part is the hardest part for me. And then um, within that data part of not knowing if something I found is actually interesting or only interesting for myself or is actually interesting but I've just been with this data set for so long that I've lost sight of myself. 
Um, and also the struggle of like doing a design and then like being with that design for so long that I'm like, oh, this thing that I'm doing is like not impressive and it's not compelling. And I think, yeah, so it's so hard. Um, but I think the kind of things that I figured out is I um, talk to someone else. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think when I'm like in the like middle of a project, I'll like ask Nadi for feedback. I'm if I'm working on something visual that I'm like now starting to get insecure about whether it's like communicating what I want, like I'll show it to other people. Even just showing it to people that like might not see visualizations too often and they're like, oh, this is actually really interesting or informative or um so those are the things that yeah, there's a lot of a lot of emotional roller coasters that I go through in the process and sometimes like please let it be done already. Like can I just be on the other side of this process? But um and there are other pe there are some projects that I just like haven't been able to finish because there really is nothing interesting in the data set. Like I've been struggling with a project about da like Taylor Swift lyrics for the last two years, trying to find something meaningful to tell. <laughs> something very soon. <laughs> it's on a deadline. <laughs> For the next album, maybe that's what you got. No, she, not you, no, she's not going to give me on, so the next album is this album. <laughs> um, well, that's, you brought up some great suggestions for things you do when you're stuck, like talking to other people. Um, Nadi and Jill, do you have any other suggestions for things that you do or like strategies you use when you're stuck on a project? Um, well, so just hearing Julie talk about the Taylor Swift project that has not gotten off the ground, um, I was um, just kind of looking through uh, New York City open data sets the other day, and I found this data set about um, like wild animal sightings, and I was like, oh, that would be super interesting to visualize. Um, and so I was going through it, but having kind of the same problem, like, oh, there's not actually anything interesting here. And so I just ended up kind of like collaging images of raccoons in front of the <laughs> teleport theater. <laughs> so it's so like whatever like entertains you is, is kind of a helpful process. Um, I would also say um, I have this uh, visualization that I'm working on now um, that I had the idea for like a year ago and I started collecting a bunch of data. I kind of um, like making my own data set. It's showing where uh, movies are set versus where they're filmed. Um, so I started collecting a bunch of data about a year ago, but then just kind of like, I don't know, work stuff, whatever, I lost, lost track of it. But now I've come back to it, and I'm really happy with how it's looking. It might be done soon. Um, so I'd say, like, if you have the opportunity to just, like, let something rest, that's all, always great. Just come back to it with fresh eyes. Mm. Uh, yeah, for me, I typically have two processes to get out of something when I'm stuck. So either it could be that um, during the design phase, I've tried different things and none of them are working the way I wanted to. That could be one sort of situation. What I then do is after I've sort of um, depleted all of my, like these are the first ideas I had, um, I look back and I, I try and find the things that I was kind of remotely happy with. Like in this design, this was kind of working with that one. And in this design, maybe this was working in that one. And that has, just figuring that out and then trying to see if I can mix these things that I like together has helped me on several projects to create something that we can be final product. Uh, product. Um, another thing that I have which is maybe a little bit further in the design phase, is maybe when I'm not happy with this specific visual part of the design, is that um, I might let it rest, but not like not like a year, but like just, <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, I just try and do other parts of the visual first. Um, and then sometimes because it's coming together more, like the other parts are coming together, I might be inspired by how the style of the other parts that apparently I am, unhappy with, 
rule and inform the part that I'm not happy with. I've had this on projects as well. Uh, one of them was for data sketches where I was drawing lines between groups and lines were very curvy and tapered. And as I was drawing other parts, I wasn't happy with those lines, but I didn't know what I wanted to. And so I started drawing other parts around that, other circles. And, I, and then I, I realized that the style that I was sort of going for was very straight lines and, and uh, circles and not this sort of swirliness, but kind of like either straight or curved. And that's when I was like, oh, these lines need to follow that same sort of principle. So afterwards, I really completely redid those lines. And then I was, when I saw it then, I was like, okay, now I'm happy with it. So it's kind of the, those two tracks that I, I try and get out of getting stuck. Great. Wow. It's great. I was stuck like literally an hour ago and I think this will help me. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you guys, surely you touched on this a little bit earlier, but do you ever feel um, imposter syndrome? This is something I like feel a lot. When I got asked to like moderate this panel, I was like, who am I to do that? Like, <laughs> but I mean, especially coming from such different backgrounds and there's not really like very many data viz majors out there, do you feel like you don't belong or you're not up to par or do you compare yourself to others? Sure, I mean, I think everyone feels this to some degree. I mean, it's helpful when, you know, you just see tweets of people being like, yeah, I had to, I, I tracked how many times I had to Google something today when I'm programming and it was 8,420, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, I figured it no, <laughs> I could have, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it comes up all the time. Um, I'm not sure if I have a lot to say about it. <laughs> I guess, how do you overcome it <laughs> or deal with it? So, um, I think this is, like, this is one of the things I struggle with a lot, and I feel like, wait, I feel like this is, there's three parts to this. Um, the first part is when I have a successful project and then it like goes viral or whatever, um, and then having to follow that up and I'm like, oh my God, all the eyes are on me. And if I do something that's not as great, I'm a failure. Um, and that's really, really like self-absorbed. Um, and I've had to teach myself and be like, you know, first of all, external validation is not a thing. This is, again, not about imposter syndrome anymore, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 you still have good things to say. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and then um, having to retrain myself and being like, oh, external validation is not the thing that I should base my, my project's worth on, and I should base my project's worth on how much I like it, on how much uh, fun I had with it. Um, and then... Um, my friend RJ Andrews, um, he had a really great thing he told me, which is that um, if you really think about the impact of a project that you've released, um, the kind of the retweets and the likes is like that initial rush. Um, but really the most important and most valuable and impactful part is um, the inspiration that you provided someone like years like maybe weeks or months or years down the line and then you don't even know about. Um, again, this has nothing to do with imposter <laughs> But I'll eventually get there, I'm sorry. Um, and then the second part um, is um, seeing all of the really amazing works um, that come out of, let's say, these like big newsrooms. Um, I got to judge for Malachi earlier this year, um, and you know we went through like a thousand different entries from different size newsrooms, and every time I was looking at one of these, I was like, wow, this is amazing, the polish is amazing, the design is amazing, the data set is amazing, the code is amazing. Um, like, how am I ever gonna live up to this? Um, and what I realized like is these are, a team of like, you know, 10, 20 people working on like one subset of it and I'm trying to compare myself. Like I'm trying to compare my work and my skill set to like 10 people's worth of work. Um, and that really sunk in when, um, actually we were judging Nadi's piece. Um, <laughs> and we were judging, uh, you were like, uh, the constellations, uh, the star, the figures. figures in the sky, thank you. Um, and one of the other judges that came from like a pretty traditional newsroom was like, 
oh, this is done by one person. This whole thing is done by one person. Like, that's really amazing. Um, and it was that moment for me that I was like, oh, like, the reason why I feel imposter syndrome is because you know, I'm comparing myself everything I do to like a whole newsroom but like actually just individually the work I do even if it's not perfect you know in the storytelling part or the data analysis part or the design part or whatever um, I'm just one person and I was able to accomplish this like that's really cool like congrats to me um, and that's how that's how I've like gotten through uh, feeling inferior to everybody out there yeah that's great that's great um, you guys also have so much experience. Oh, did you want to say that? Go for it. Uh, I, yeah, a small addition. Uh, for me specifically, I was, so my background is not in coding, so I always feel like my part of the imposter syndrome was like the wizard boss, where there's like some display that kind of has a visual like appeal to it, but if you open the curtain, like the code below it is like based on like, <laughs> Nothing. It's going to fall apart at any time. And I hope nobody ever looks at my code. I'm just ugly by it just because so they don't see how ugly my code actually is. That's how it was in feels for, for me and when I, especially when uh, I see what other people have done now that the information is beautiful, words long list is out. I always go through it all and then I feel I feel like amazingly inspired and amazingly down on how amazing I feel for other people are doing. My, my, my answer is that I, I don't get over it. it. It happens every time. I just keep going. Again, with the idea that it's been going fine so far. <laughs> I'm just going to have to live with it. That's good. That's great. Um, you all have so much experience. How has your process changed from when you first started doing database to now? Do you look back and you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> what was I doing? Like, how, how have, do you feel like you've gained more knowledge or skills, or what's changed since you first started practicing? I just talked. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you're about to yeah. <laughs> uh, Let me think. OK, so the, the biggest change is that I don't have to make charts in ClickView anymore. <laughs> but I mean, it, I mean, nothing against ClickView. Just, it wasn't for me, and I know other people make amazing things in ClickView. Um, what has changed? Well, I think I spend uh, a lot more time just with a pen and paper thinking about the design. So actually, instead of, um, you, when I started out, it was more like, oh, I, you know, my chart options are a radar, well, it's not, uh, like a line chart or a bar chart, which of these am I going to put it into? And these days, I don't think about that. I really think about what is the goal, what is my data, what is the data about? And I just then really take the time with just plain pen and paper to think about designs that will hopefully um, you know, answer the question, the goal that I have. And I didn't used to do that. And I think that makes the biggest difference for me now in how my visuals are turning out. Because just taking the time to actually think about how you want to visualize it instead of going for the available chart options. So, uh, yeah, like Sarah said, I briefly touched this on um, earlier because actually I thought that was the question that this was the, yeah. Um, so, uh, I think one of the biggest things that have changed for me is starting out so tech focused and doing everything for the joy of like a technical challenge um, and realizing that um, the end user is actually what's more important, most important, and whether they can read, um, like what I'm trying to say. And so these days, um, whereas before, I was actually rereading some of my data sketches, like um, earliest data sketches from 2016, and even in my design section, my sketch section, I would say like. I'm going to do a GUI effect, so that's with SVG filters, and um, and then I'm going to use a blend mode, and it was like a very like I was coming from a very technical place, and then I was reading kind of my most recent data sketches, and it's like in the sketches section, it's about like how like what will the uh, reader get out of this? Like what's the visual encoding I'm going to do? What's the visual metaphor I'm going to use? Um, and so it's really kind of 
for me, shift of 180, um, I think definitely for the better, um, to uh, yeah, really consider the end experience. Yeah, I mean, I think along those lines, my process has changed a little bit too, just because um, initially I think I went into things thinking I knew how I wanted it to look. Like, I just, I would kind of decide on what form it would take before I really dug into the data or, like, really did any exploration with, like, different forms it could take. I'd just be like, yeah, it makes sense to say I'll just do that. And I went down that path and went the whole way. And now I think I spend more time looking at the data initially just to see if I can see patterns and trends before I even visualize it. And then when I do visualize it, I take, so, like, usually like a sample of the code and kind of like start looking at various ways that it could um, be encoded or that it could play out um, to sort of tell the story that's the most interesting. So similar to both of your, your processes, I think, but somewhere in the I just realized another thing. I uh, used to always use code as my one hammer. Like, um, I would be like, the simple thing that I can do with Excel spreadsheets, actually, I'm just gonna code it. Only because I like didn't realize Excel spreadsheets was something I could use for my data. Um, and that's the other thing that's really changed for me. Like, whereas before, I'm like, I can use code to do everything. Now I'm like, let's only use code to do um, what it's good for and makes it the most efficient. And if you know, um, cleaning data in a, like a Google spreadsheet is going to be a lot faster, or like drawing out a complex SVG path is going to be faster in an Illustrator. Let's do it that way. So kind of like this broadening of my tool set. Um, I think that's been really helpful too. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I guess while we're talking about tools. Um, I think I actually used to use less code, and now I use more. I mean, just like in terms of like frameworks and stuff, like I used to, everything used to be just like uh, vanilla JS, and you know, now I usually use React or something like that. Um, but, but in addition to that, like I also now am doing a lot more um, like drawing of data. So I've been really obsessed with um, traffic flow maps from urban plans of the mid 20th century. Oh. They're really crazy looking. You should check my Twitter. Wow. There's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but so because of that, I was like, oh, I'd really love to look at what traffic flow in New York City looks like. Um, but I decided rather than doing it with code, I'd just draw it all by hand, which doing stuff by hand takes a long time, but it's fun, you know? And so my methodology wasn't perfect because the data wasn't like, exactly the way it needed to be, but there is like subway, uh, oh yeah, so I did traffic of uh, subway commuters basically. So there's uh, data for turnstile um, usage per hour or whatever. And so basically I like plotted the dots for each subway station in New York and then like created kind of a bubble size based on the traffic in one hour and then kind of like connected these dots. Um, filled it all in. Anyway, and so there's an image somewhere on Twitter of it. Um, it took a very long time, but it, it sort of helps you understand the data better and sort of understand the process and like really, I mean, it's just like a very visceral thing that is fun for me to do. And so I've been doing more of that. But definitely, like if you just try to do that with data sets that are huge, like you're going to be at the drawing board for a while. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating that drawing came as become more part of your process as you gain more experience. That's really unexpected, but very cool, very cool. Um, Jill, this is a great segue. You were talking about doing a hand-drawn data viz. Um, Shirley and Jill, I know you both have done analog data viz, like building things in physical space or like drawing things by hand. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those projects and how maybe they're very different, like what's different from doing a digital project versus something that's analog? Sure. So the um, the main um, analog data viz that I did um, was it two years ago, I think. Um, it was this project I did called Broken Windows and Pink Tickets. So if you know anything about policing in New York City, um, there's the Broken Windows policy, which kind of goes uh, by the rule that like if you fix the like most like just like 
the smallest infractions, then that will have a better effect on the city as a whole. I don't believe in that policy, but um, so uh, NYPD issues criminal court summonses, otherwise known as pig tickets, for these minor infractions. So anything such as like riding a bike on a sidewalk or spitting in public or um, possession of marijuana in small amounts, um, it, they really run the gamut. Um, Anyway, so these criminal court summonses, uh, the ticketing data is available, and so I wanted to visualize it in physical space. So basically I tallied the number of summonses issued by type for each police precinct, and then I used paracord, which is like a string basically, and it comes in a lot of different colors, which is why I used it. Um, so every color represented a different infraction type and the length of the string represented the number of infractions, and then I bundled um, the, the type, the infraction types for each uh, precinct, and then hung them in a way that kind of represented the physical space of New York. Um, I, uh, here are images of it. So, um, so uh, that's just background on what the piece was. Actually creating it was um, just so time intensive because I mean, so first of all, I had to like go through and like get the data, do all the data cleaning, figure out like how many summonses were issued by type per precinct. Um, then I had to order this paracord and then I spent like hours and hours and hours on my floor cutting paracord at various lengths. You know, I had like many parties where people came over and I made them cut paracord. <laughs> I'm a blast. <laughs> uh, also convinced my friends to um, build that pergola that it hung from. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, if you want to be um, put to work, you know, become friends with me. <laughs> no, but um, it was, I mean, it was really interesting. And it, what I like about it most is the, um, it really sparked a lot of conversations. So it was part of a, an exhibit in Brooklyn um, called Data Through Design that was um, part of the mayor's office's design, open design or open data week, something like that. Um, but so it was great because at the opening I was like encouraging people to, to walk through it and kind of like tell me like where in the city do you live? Like you can see kind of like how many infractions there were and like I'll, an underlying sort of message from this was just showing sort of like um, that communities of color are sort of adversely affected by this sort of policing. And so I just wanted to visualize that, and I think it had, like, had a big effect. Um, and it was just like a very good conversation starter. Um, so yeah, very time intensive, but I think it was worth it. And so I want to do more work like this. Yeah, so um, for me, like, I love, I love like physical data viz like this. Um, and I actually first saw, um, I think the first time I saw one um, was maybe back in 2014, um, a project called Wage Islands. Um, I don't know if Joe, you can pull it up or not. Um, it's called Wage Islands by a person whose name I can never pronounce. It's like, it's like E-K-E, -E, yeah, that one. Um, and the concept behind it was, um, it was it's Manhattan. Um, I, I have, have anybody seen this before? Um, and so, yeah, Jill, you've seen it. Um, and so this is a um, view of Manhattan where um, what's being revealed is the parts of Manhattan that um, the, that income level can afford. So um, I think in one of the images, it might show like this, um, there's an input that you can put your annual income. And maybe it's like a, maybe it's another photo further down in the slideshow. Sorry, if you can keep going on the slideshow. Um, yeah, so you can put in your hourly wage and that will um, raise or decrease the um, water level and the water, as you can see, is black. So then um, the lower your hourly wage, um, the less that's revealed to you and the um, higher, like the more that is revealed to you like that. Um, and 
that was so mind blowing the first time I saw it. This kind of like, not only is it um, in the physical realm, so there's a third dimension added into it, but also this kind of metaphor of um, revealing um, and when you don't have much that everything is submerged. Um, so I think I saw this in 2014, it blew my mind. This was like very early in my database journey. Um, and since then, this whole like obsession with physical data viz has, yeah, it's, it's been like kind of in the back of my mind. And then last year in 2018, I made it a goal because I've been like talking about it for so long. Um, I made it a goal to do something physical. Um, and I realized um, when I started thinking about it that um, a lot of, like, when, when I started thinking about physical, all I could think of was doing something on like a projection on the wall or on a TV, which like completely, you know, ignores that third dimension that opens up. Um, and when I realized that it was because my day job is like in the 2D and that's why I don't know how to think in the third dimension, I did a project last year. Um, if you could just go to, um, yeah, the website, sorry, my website, um, and then uh, if you go down, um, it's called Legends, and it's like a bright pink one. Um, it's bright pink, that one, yeah. <laughs> um, and so this is my first uh, 3D data viz, and it's of the 51, 51 women Nobel laureates since 1901. Actually, the interactions are a little bit finicky. Is it all right if I come over and thank you? <laughs> so, um, each of the crystals represent um, one of the women, and you can kind of like zoom and like quote unquote walk through them to read about them. Um, so the, their size are the, their quote unquote influence or the number of backlinks they have on Wikipedia. The color is um, the category of their award. Um, and then it's hard to tell, but the number of faces is like the number of references at the bottom of their Wikipedia page. So it's like how multifaceted they are. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so you can walk through them. Um, and then the reason why I got so excited about this project is because um, at one point I realized I was like still thinking about everything in a very 2D way and how to lay them out. And when I realized that I could um, organize them by decade to use that Z index as the decade, um, that um, really kind of opened up my mind. Um, and then that's when I realized, like, for this particular project, like, that's the number of women that have won the Nobel Prize since 1901. That's all of them. And each of the stars you see floating around them is one of the 853 men that have won the award in the same amount of time. Um, so, yeah, so since then, um, I've been kind of even more obsessed with this idea of creating, like, a physical data viz. Um, and I think that obsession comes from kind of those like immersive experiences where you get to like stand in the middle of an art piece and um, really experience it. And I think that has so much more of a lasting impression than like when we see something on the screen and then we're like scrolling through it. Um, and let me see if I can find it. So it's um, earlier this year, I collaborated with one of my office studio mates, Alice, to make, yeah. So each of these, um, it's the same data set. It's um, each flower is one of um, the 30 or so women of the last three decades, women of laureates of the last three decades. Um, and it was just a really fun experience, kind of like having to laser cut everything and paint them. And um, yeah, so that's kind of the first step. And then I'm here at IT, thank you so much. I'm uh, learning um, physical computing. I'm auditing a class called physical computing. And then I'll hopefully be auditing another class called fabrication. And I just did something really silly 
um, where <laughs> yeah, on my Twitter is in case if you um. Do I have it? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that's the data series. But you can go to, oh, certainly. Yeah. Um, and then you can go. Uh, sorry, if you keep going down. Um, Congrats on getting married. <laughs> <laughs> if you, sorry, if you keep going down. Um, yeah, so I just did this. Um, this is my little, like, randomly. I called it randomly bumbling drawing machine. Um, so this is my first step all into physical, into the physical realm. I love it. I'm excited. Yeah, actually, hearing you talk about physical computing made me um, remember a project that I forgot I made um, in 2015. Um, I made a project at the Gray Area Foundation for the Arts. I was there um, for the summer as a fellowship. Um, if you go to my website, it's probably there. Um, but uh, let's see. Yeah, so um, that photo of the woman, the woman standing there. Yeah, let me put that. Yeah. So basically, I made an installation there that sort of combined something on screen and something physical. So the project that I did looked at um, invasive plant species in the Bay Area over time, um, and there were basically four that I focused on: Cape ivy. Um, French broom, a couple of others. Um, but to make it a more immersive experience, um, I brought the physical plants into the gallery and then used some sensors so that when people touched the plants, they would trigger the sort of data stories on the screen. And so that was the way that they um, interacted with those. If you scroll down, um, I think there are just a few other photos showing people um, interacting with that. And so that's actually the first physical um, sort of data is that I did, and it was sort of that combination between um, a physical and a and screen-based uh, thing. Yeah. I hope you guys make so many more, and Nadia, I hope you get into physical data too. I can only imagine what wonderful things would come forth. This is amazing. Um, I'm going to pivot real quick. So when the Database Society was founded less than a year ago, um, it has become like this beautiful community where people can talk and share stories. And a few months ago, it launched a Medium publication. And the first article that was published there was by Stephanie Evergreen. And it was wonderful. She shared her experiences as being a woman in data biz. And um, if you haven't read it, please look it up right now. It's called Beyond Nightingale, Women in Data Biz. In that in her sh stories, um, she was able to start a lot of conversations about how um, sometimes women or people of color or other minorities can be left out and there can be echo chambers in data biz. And so I wanted to ask you guys, who have been in this field for much longer than I have, um, how, what, I don't want to focus on negative things because there's plenty of that in this world. But what positive things do you see people doing to be more inclusive? Or how do you feel that you have been included and uh, like an important part of this community? Like what things have people done to help you feel like you belong? Uh, I feel that when I was starting out in data visualization, I feel that several people have mentioned my name here and there to possible clients. That really helped me as well getting started. Uh, also, for example, I remember really new into, into data visualization and I was um, invited into a Slack channel that was about database. It was just a bunch of people, maybe 12 of them. Uh, Shirley was one of them. and. Um, uh, I knew some of the names, like Elijah Meeks, Jim Blandingham, and Elijah was like, hey, I saw the last thing you did on blocks, it looks cool, come join us. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, that was also really cool, just getting, my, that was like my foot in the door and getting into the database community, because again, especially like five years ago, database and where I was, was like, I, where is everybody? It's not here. Um, so, that, so that was wonderful, being being really included into that sort of mini group that eventually grew bigger, and uh, yeah, that was that was lovely. 
just, you know, other people, uh, okay, I'm now having a translation problem in my head. Uh, let me try and say it differently about the words. Um, <laughs> maybe there's not just not a good translation for it. Uh, other people are wanting to give you things. You sort of, yeah. It's like, oh, God. I feel like I need to Google Translate. <laughs> you want to hear all that? In Dutch, it's called the Grun Factor. It's like when people are like, they are, their like, willingness to do something for you is high. Uh, and I felt, I, I felt that a lot when I was uh, starting out. I think that's also very present in the Indian community. Also when, when I have, um, I'm only one person, I can only do so much work, and when people email me and I feel like either it's not quite my focus of database or I can't take it on, I'm like, please reach out to these people that can do it for you. So I'm like, we're all, and other people again point them towards me when they feel like it's not quite their thing. We're not. We're not. I don't do not feel any kind of competition in the field of database. It's like we're all trying to help each other make database better and trying to find the best fits for the clients that are looking for database. That's how it's been feeling for me. Yeah, so um, one of the things I wanted to mention on this one is. Um, I came from uh, the Bay Area D3 user group, um, and this was, that meetup um, was one of the first meetups I was trying out when I graduated from college in 2012. And I had moved out to San Francisco, and I was like newly in software, and I didn't know where to start, but I was like, maybe I can meet some people on meetup. Um, and I went to a bunch of like meetups. Um, I went to like HTML5 and like UX and the big ones. Um, and I felt really, really intimidated. Like I spent the evening just like in a corner being like, I don't know who to say hi to. Like I don't want to say hi to anyone. I'm just really scared. Um, and the D3 user group was actually um, the first time I felt so actively welcomed. Um, and I think that um, when I became more and more involved, because it was so warm and welcoming and really encouraged me to get involved, um, and that's when I met Ian Johnson and Kai Chang, the two like co-founders of the meetup, and back then like the main organizers. Um, Ian was like, you know, D3 has already like got such a learning curve that like we try not to intimidate anyone, like we try to welcome everybody in. Um, it was like that really warm atmosphere that like made me feel less intimidated at like 22, 23 being a woman, like not knowing anything. Um, and I think, um, so I think that's the positive thing I really wanted to bring up. like. Um, when a meetup could be a welcoming, and, and we try to be absolutely welcoming to anybody that looks at me that's like sitting by themselves and will be like, hey, like my name is Shirley, like um, how are you, like is this your first time, um, like what brought you here, oh hey, like please meet this person who might be like a regular, like um, let's all have a conversation together. And we actively try to do that. Um, and. I think that's really helped a lot. So um, I, I felt a lot of sexism being a woman in tech, but um, I think just coming from like the D3, like the Bay Area D3 user group, I haven't really ever felt it um, in that database community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing that I really appreciate um, is that um, we also organize the annual D3 OnComp, and one of the things that we have like a very strict like kind of pride in is that every year we have two keynote speakers, and every year um, we invite women speakers. Um, and maybe that sounds like reverse discrimination, but we're just, we just want to make a point that like all these conferences that are like you know there's not enough good women speakers out there. We're like no. Yep. We're going to show you. Um, and so I think that's also Ian and Kai and a lot of the other organizers leading by example. Ian was always like, every year we're going to have women speakers. Um, and they were really about like promoting um, women. And I think that's like something really absolutely amazing. And I hope, like, you know, we keep doing it. Okay.
Can I add one more thing to mine? So another uh, very positive memory that I have is, so when I, uh, I told you that I, I knew database was my thing from this presentation slide by Mike Freeman, well, his presentation was also pretty awesome about uh, storytelling in database. And after I um, was home again, I'm like, I'm going to apply this technique of storytelling to com um, convey database. So I made this sort of core diagram and really explained it through like steps and animations and and then I emailed him and like, hey, I made this thing uh, and it uses your uh, your sort of stepping process, step process, and thank you so very much. And he sends such a, a super sweet email back, it's like, oh my god, I can't believe you made it. Look, it looks great. I mean, that was that was super awesome. And then it became even more awesome because he tweeted about it. Oh. And like, oh my god, look at this amazing thing. It was a, a wonderful tweet. Uh -huh. And then to top that off, um, my boss doc then retweeted it. But he didn't retweet Mike's tweet. He actually went back to my Twitter account, looked up my tweet about it, oh. and then retweeted that. And I still have a screenshot of Twitter notifying me <laughs> of my boss doc retweeting me, because at that point I had so few followers that I had notifications on for <laughs> But that also, I mean, just that again, that willingness to help and, and then take that extra step to help promote somebody who, might, you know, who could use it, um, that was a real encouragement as well. And also something that is in the back of my mind now that maybe I can now help other people in that same way that that helped me get my first sort of share of followers that then eventually grew and, and snowballs in that sense. Such a humble brag in there. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> seeing the kind of style that I did and I worked with E three. So that helped a lot. So create your portfolio website. So Nadi stole my first one, uh, my foremost one. Uh, so I'll follow that with, actually that's perfect, because then I'll follow that up with saying, um, if you can have a financial buffer, because that financial buffer will make sure that you're not desperate to take on any um, client project um, and that you can be picky about the ones that um, are really like the ones that you want to do that will um, kind of help you curate that portfolio even more to add to that's the snowball effect right like you do one that you love you put it on your portfolio and that will attract more clients and if you spend time doing like projects that just for the money and you don't want to put it on your portfolio, like 
that's yeah, that's the have the financial buffer so that you can um, have the freedom to only say yes to the projects that are going to further advance that freelance career. Yeah, I'd also say um, don't do any work for free. I mean, a lot of times people will ask you to do a certain amount up front, just so they can kind of see what you're thinking, and like, don't do that. Um, also, you should ask for more money than you think you should. It took me a long time to learn that, but you should. Um, uh, I'd also say um, make sure to plan in, I'd say, as much time for project management as for actually creating the project, because that's a huge part of it. Um, if you're freelancing and you're a uh, sole proprietor, like you're doing everything. So just be aware of before you go into it that that's what you're taking on. Um, I did it for like 12 years and it's really fun, but uh, it's definitely like you're, you're, you have all the balls in the air, you know, you're wearing all the hats, all the metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can I add something? Um, about pricing, I, so I find pricing difficult, but um, to maybe a few things about that. I don't give one price, I give a range of prices. Like for this, between this and this price, you probably get something along these lines. For this and this price, you get something along these lines. So I give three kind of options and price ranges because then it doesn't become a yes or no, more becomes a which one of them is. I also say like, but if you have a fixed budget, tell me that. Uh, so we can, I can see what I can fit in there. But typically they don't go that, they don't go that round. It's not like, oh, we have so much money. <laughs> Uh, also, make sure that this sort of this price ranges is basically your second or third email. Um, you don't want to get too far into the process and then realize that they can't afford you. So the first email might be uh, the first sort of sections of emails like, uh, "Hey, we want you to do something for us," and then I can email I email back like, "Oh, that's uh, that's cool. What do you want me to do? Can you give me more information? Is it like online, static, mobile? How? What's the data about?" Then it goes into, "Can we set up a call?" Uh, because I feel like the initial calls, they get a sense of like, what do you want and what I want, it's just easier to get a call. After that call, they get the budget email. Uh -huh. And I'm not doing anything in between. I have had my fingers burned by uh -huh. re renowned companies uh -huh. where I thought I should do more for them. And then I made, even made a design, and then they're like, oh, that's an interesting design. We'll just, you know, see how far we get ourselves. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Like after the initial emails and initial chat, the next email is the budget email. Oh yeah. I'm gonna just echo those and say don't work for free unless it's for like a nonprofit thing. Um, and I love what Nadi just said, which is like if they ask you for a smaller budget, don't cut your hourly or your daily, but just do less for them. I love that a lot. Well thank you so much. This has been so insightful. Let's give our speakers a round of applause. Two questions, and then you can go back to mingling and reading. Hi, my name is Krista, and my question is What are your thoughts on ethics of databases? Do you have any examples of past projects that has tricky ethics to it? Yeah, so uh, great question. Um, the first thing that really comes to mind for me is um, the ones with data sets with people and then um, how what is the fine line you draw for um, the amount of information you show for a person like obviously you're not going to do name well actually it really depends I feel like um, for some of the journalism that some of the storytelling I've, told, uh, I've, I've done like obviously the name is really important and so it's it's kind of about like how much can you reveal for the sake of telling the story and how much are you revealing that's too much that's sensationalizing so I worked um, on a, a project that may never be published I don't know I'm really sad um, it's for the Guardian it's about the causes of homeless deaths um, and so they had images of homeless people that have died um, and there was a debate about whether we should use their images or not and I felt like that that might 
be putting it over the top from like a data perspective that like maybe we can put their name and their age and um and the cause maybe um and like when we're just highlighting a few of the people but then i felt like putting their photo was a little too much but um you know from the journalist perspective they're like no this is what like this is what makes the reader connect so i feel like it's a very fine line but that's that's the project that that reminds me of, of and for me, the ethics part, the trickiest part, is always when it's data about people and how much do you reveal and how much do you not reveal. Yeah, I'd say the same. Um, so last summer, I uh, did a project with Data for Change. I, I was in Jordan, and I worked with the Arab Women's Organization on a project about um, child marriage uh, in Syria and Jordan. And so again, it was like very tricky data. Um, but there, we were working hand in hand with the organization on the ground, and so it was really kind of like we let them lead that process and, and sort of decide um, how they wanted to handle the narrative and everything. And basically, like, the project ended up, um, it, it was called A Girl with a Doll, it ended up being kind of like a storybook almost, um, that was used in workshops that they did with mothers and um, their daughters, and the data was only used to sort of shape that narrative, um, no specific at all. And so we just let them sort of, um, you know, kind of lead that process. Let's take one more question. Go wait, yeah, right in back. Hello, my name is Minya. Um, I'm wondering what it means by doing less, like for the budget. <laughs> Because I recently got interviewed by the company and they asked me to do the presentation, like giving me some data set I needed to visualize it. But it was just interview, but I'm, you know, I don't know how to, I mean, okay, what does it mean by doing less? Like, depending on the budget. Because if we are given the data set, then we can, I don't know how I can, <laughs> control the level of detail or level of insights or what do you mean by doing less? Like no there is that is the the same. So well it's yeah it's um so for me where my ranges are typically um by less I mean it's like how much um interaction or how many charts or is it static? So my my le my less bucket is static. I'm gonna make one thing for you, it's gonna have one size only, so we're gonna be like an Illustrator file or a PNG file, that's what you get. Uh, and, and if you want more static files, that will just, you know, times the, the amount. Uh, and then the next one could be like, it's gonna be uh, online, it's might, it might be size, it might have a very subtle, if you hover over something, the, um, you know, the color might fade, I don't know. It's like simple interactivity and resizing. Another step could be like it's going to be something where you can do a lot of interactivity you can maybe zoom around click around and then animations happen and then like the the major bucket could be like complete storytelling we're going to do like a full page it's going to have three visuals in there uh and it's going to be mobile friendly and, and all all the bells and whistles i can create for you so that's all based on the same data set and it depends on um i mean every every data set might have like your main goal and even with the static visual, you can sort of try and explain that, but the more the more you add on to that, sort of the more context you can give, the more freedom you can give to people to maybe see that main insight, but also see the side stories, or look at it from a different angle, or pull out some sort of other things that make a separate visualization for that as well. So that's how I see from going from less to more uh, in my in sort of how I price my, my projects, even for the same data. Thank you guys again.